Now let's look on one paper that's been written on India's air and water pollution. The authors are Michael Greenstone and Rima Hanna. The paper is online, and I also recommend their slides, also online, which have many useful charts and pictures. The environmental Kuznets curve refers to the notion that, at some level of wealth, societies start investing more in cleaner air and water. Typically, the turning point is considered to be at or slightly below $8,000 a year in terms of per capita income. At these levels of wealth, people start caring more about the environment. Part of the problem in India is that per capita income is still below this level, and not surprisingly, many aspects of the environment in India are still getting worse rather than better. Let's look first at air pollution, and if you've been to India, you probably know this is a problem in a lot of Indian cities and even rural areas. There's something called ambient particulate matter concentrations, and those are a problem in India. They're about five times higher than those in the United States. In China, it's even worse. They're about seven times higher. What that concept simply means is it refers to different kinds of particles suspended in the air, and very often these particles are bad for human health. The good news is that there has been action in India from the Supreme Court, and among a number of other policies, one thing that Indian governments have done is that they have mandated catalytic converters. What catalytic converters do is take some of the toxic emissions from motor vehicles and make them less toxic. So this is good for the air. And to study the effects of these policies, the authors look at data from 140 different Indian cities. Here's how the authors describe their own method. They're going to exploit the differential implementation of these policies across cities and use that to test for the impacts of air and water pollution concentrations. They're going to compare changes in city-level pollution before and after the implementation of these policies. And finally, they're going to control for national changes in pollution. So basically, they're looking at different cities which have different policies, and that gives us some natural variation. And they're going to look at outcomes and see how much did these different policies really matter. What's striking is that air pollution regulations in India have had a positive impact. Major problems remain, but there have been improvements, especially from mandated catalytic converters. The policies have really mattered. Let's now look at water pollution. Here, a key fix is what are called sewage treatment plants, which do what the name indicates. And the authors looked at data from 424 cities, which are connected to 162 different rivers. And they're going to use the same method of looking at the cross-sectional variation in policy, comparing that to outcomes, and then adjusting for changes in the level of national pollution. And what they find is that overall water regulation has been much less effective than air pollution regulation. For instance, policy has not been effective in lowering levels of F. coli. And you can think of F. coli as a bacteria, which is the result of human and animal waste. It's one way of measuring the cleanliness of your water supply. So why are the water pollution regulations apparently less effective, even though they're often in the same places as the air pollution regulations? One hypothesis the authors suggest is that the air pollution regulations often stemmed from the Indian Supreme Court, which has more political legitimacy than a lot of Indian municipalities. Another hypothesis suggested is that the sewage treatment plants require a lot more follow-up investment and consistent application and execution of subsequent improvements to be effective, and that these subsequent executions involve a lot more investment in resources. And this may simply be a harder act to pull off. In terms of underlying lessons, I would suggest these. First, the law matters, and that the fight against pollution is not merely a function of per capita income. Second, progress in this area is not automatic, and not all laws are going to be effective. It's also a key point that passing good-sounding laws once is only a small part of the overall fight to lower pollution, that a key issue really has to do with follow-up investment and execution over time, and this can be difficult for economies which are both poorer and have imperfectly operating institutions.